Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about reconstructing temporal progression of HIV immune response pathways using a new tool that we developed called TimePath. Okay, to start out with, uh, this is the overview of the process that we want to model. So the blobs that you see in gray are the HIV-1 viruses. And the model is that the viral proteins of the HIV-1 um, uh, virus, the viral proteins, they interact with the host protein inside uh, um, a human cell. Uh, and then that uh, interaction causes further interactions and a signaling cascade that downstream activates uh, transcription factors that cause change in uh, uh, expression. So uh, based, based on uh, observing the time series, uh, time series uh, diff uh, gene expression, we want to be able to infer the signaling pathways. And there are a bunch of tools to do that. Some of them are listed here. Uh, the problem is that none of them really take the temporal information into account. Uh, TimeXNX kind of tries to, but you still are not able to uh, get uh, a particular when each protein acts, like a temporal annotation of when a protein acts. What we really want is something like uh, this figure. Here, what basic, I'm going to explain this figure in detail later on. But in the red, what you have are the host proteins that interact with the viral proteins. The blue proteins are the intermediate signaling proteins. And the green proteins are the transcription factors. And the orange nodes, they represent um, ex, um, differentially, uh, clusters of differentially expressed genes. So what you want is like an overview of how the um, source proteins uh, activate signaling pathways, the intermediate signaling proteins, which activate the transcription factors, which cause differential expression. And then furthermore, how uh, those differentially expressed genes activate further signaling uh, pathways that cause differential expression later on. Uh, one thing, uh, so this is an overview of our method. So to start out with, the input that we have is the time series gene expression data. Uh, the uh, virus host protein interaction data. So this is which virus proteins are interacting with which uh, host cell proteins. The protein DNA interaction data and the protein protein interaction data. Uh, in our application here, uh, the only condition specific data that we use specific to HIV is the first two, the gene expression data and the virus host protein interaction data. Um, the other two are non-condition specific. So based on this data, we first extract uh, candidate pathways that go from source proteins, which are the proteins interacting with the um, viral proteins, uh, sorry, host proteins interacting with the viral proteins, to the differentially expressed genes, which we call targets. One important thing I would like to note is that uh, the target proteins that we choose, we choose uh, different target proteins for uh, different time points. So uh, f we, we first choose, uh, so suppose you have three time points. First, we'll choose the differentially expressed. Uh, <laughs> first, uh, we'll choose the, yeah. First, we'll choose the differentially expressed. Uh, all right. First, we'll choose the differentially expressed uh, proteins for the first time point. And then when we try to choose the differentially expressed proteins for the second time point, we will make sure that none of those proteins are also in the first list. Because what we want to do is we want to find out um, pathways that are activated. For the second time point, we want to find out pathways that are activated by differential expression of the genes in the first time point. All right. So how do we incorporate time? Um, so our hypothesis is that differential expression at a later time point is caused by a differential expression of a gene at the previous time point. So uh, this is just a graphical depiction of how this operates. So suppose we have a pathway from a source to a target, which is in the orange. Uh, the target's at time point two. If there is a protein at time point one in that pathway, then we are good. That is a pathway that we will accept. However, if there is a protein, uh, no, no protein at time point one, so suppose it's all at time point zero or all at time point two, then we are not satisfying our hypothesis that the differential expression of the gene at time point two is caused by a uh, differential expression of the gene at time point one, so we will not accept those pathways. Okay, the pathway search. 
So to extract the candidate pathways, uh, what we, each pathway has a score, which basically indicates our confidence in whether that pathway is real or not. I'm not going to go into detail because of time as to how we score these pathways, but it's in the paper. Uh, what we do is we search for the highest scoring pathways from the source proteins to the target proteins with the temporal constraint I mentioned before. Now, once I do that, we do that, uh, we, use, uh, we, want, we want to get uh, the most succinct explanation of uh, the, the differential expression of these targets. Uh, so the, we want to basically get a minimal set of genes that can still explain as many of the targets that are differentially expressed as possible. So we use integer, a technique called integer programming to filter the set of pathways, the candidate pathways that we have to a smaller set of pathways. Um, this is how the model looks like. I'm just gonna talk about uh, the objective function and, uh, briefly. So in the objective function, what we're trying to do is in the first part, we're trying to maximize the weighted sum of the pathways uh, to the targets. We're also trying to maximize the number of targets reached, so the number of targets explained, while we're trying to, penal while penalizing the number of genes used. So once we have, uh, we run this model, we get a filtered set of um, genes. Now how to get testable predictions from this? What we really want is a ranked list of the signaling proteins and transcription factors that are relevant to the disease from this filtered set of pathways that we have. So how do we rank the proteins? As I mentioned before, each pathway has a score. So we use the weighted sum of pathways going through a protein or a protein-protein interaction to rank uh, the protein or the protein-protein interaction. Um, with a higher rate, uh, with a higher score indicating a better rank. So just visually, uh, an example, if we had just two um, uh, filtered pathways, uh, then one with 0.5, one with 0.2 score, then P300, for instance, is present in both of these pathways, so its score would be 0.7 and the score of the edge from P300 to P53 would be 0.7 as well. Importantly, we can also get time point specific rankings because each path, since uh, our, we have a target for each time point and the target is unique for that time point because uh, we are imposing constraint that the targets have to be different for each time point, we can assign each pathway uh, particular which uh, time point it belongs to, which, uh, and so to get time point specific rankings of proteins or protein-protein interactions, we just use the subset of pathways for that time point. Okay, so we apply this to HIV-1 data. So just to go over the data brief briefly, uh, the gene expression data was measured by RNA-seq uh, by a group in Switzerland. Uh, they measured 12 time points for the HIV-1 infection. Uh, the viral, host pro ho viral protein host protein interactions were taken from VerhostNet. The protein protein interactions were take constructed from BioGrid and HPRD. And the TF gene regulatory interactions were constructed based on chips and code chipseq data. To do some statistical validation, we also had uh, RNAi screen data. So in this, they, uh, people basically um, knocked down genes one by one, um, and then measured the effect of change in HIV viral load um, after knocking down the genes. And if the change was significant, then that gene was classified as a screen hit. So um, there were multiple studies done. We did some post-processing on the studies to get a set of list of genes that we were really confident in, and they amounted to 364 genes. We also downloaded path reactome pathways for HIV-1. Um, which uh, ended up consisting of 1225 edges, protein-protein uh, interactions. Okay, so this is the resulting network that we get after applying, uh, running our method. The source proteins, which are the proteins interacting with the viral proteins are in red, the intermediate signaling proteins are in uh, blue, the transcription factors in green, and the um, exp nodes uh, representing clusters of differentially expressed genes in orange. There are two proteins I would like to highlight here. One is LCK, which you can see at the third um, column, which has the, the third uh, blue gene column at the bottom. Uh, this is a protein that is known to take part in HIV-1 assembly after the HIV has integrated itself into the genome. 
Uh, so we would expect it to show up in a later phase, and uh, as you can see, it shows up in the third phase. Another protein that I want to highlight is PSMA4 at the top of the same column. Um, this is something that we rank highly for all three phases, but because we can't display too much information in one graph, it's not shown in the first two phases. But uh, we know that this is also important for HIV, and we see it here as well. So on to statistical validation. So the first thing we wanted to see was um, what part of a, what step of our algorithm uh, was contributing how much to improve performance. So before we, the way we did that was we tried to measure the overlap of the proteins we had, the rank list of proteins we had, with the um, RNA screen hits, which we know are biologically relevant for HIV-1 infection. Uh, so the overlap to begin with was 2.1%. After we filtered the, the genes that were not expressed in the time three gene expression data, the overlap increased to 3.7%. After extracting the candidate pathways, it increased to 10.4%. And after running the filtering, it increased to 14%, um, showing that each stage improves the biological relevance of the pathways that we discover. We also compared it to two other methods, SDREM and uh, TimexNet. And in the first column, what you see is overlap of the top 100 ranked proteins with the RNAi hits. And TimePod does the best out of all the three. Uh, on the right side, you see the overlap. So we also extra, uh, extracted a list of the protein-protein interactions that each method extracted uh, from the base protein-protein interaction network. And the overlap uh, with React Home Edges, as you can see, is for time path is much higher than uh, that for SDREM or TimexNet. We also wanted to um, get the imp uh, understand the importance of the time constraint. So we ran time path with and without the time constraint. And with the time constraint, it, the overlap with the number of react images is a lot higher. Though, interestingly, the overlap with the number of screen hits is about the same. We also tried to do some experimental validation of the temporal predictions. So as far as, when, you know, as we know, um, this is the first time anyone has really done, tried to do time-specific validation of uh, proteins in the context of an infection. Uh, so what we did was we found off-the-shelf inhibitors for some of the proteins that we uh, extracted for each uh, time phase. And we uh, applied those inhibitors at various time points during the course of the HIV-1 infection. So there are two cases I want to highlight. So you would expect a, a protein that we rank highly for all three phases. No matter when we apply the inhibitor, it should show a big change uh, in the uh, uh, relative infection, no, uh, no matter at what time you apply the inhibitor. But suppose we apply the inhibitor for a protein that we rank only um, a high at a first time point, say, and um, low at later time points. We should see only an effect when we apply the inhibitor at the earlier time point, and not much effect if you apply it at a later time point. And if you look at the figure, uh, stat, and uh, PSMA4, which are marked as one, two, three, uh, those were ranked highly in all three phases and showed a significant effect in all three time points, uh, th three times the inhibitor was applied, whereas um, nf -Kava b and RAF1, which are um, uh, um, labeled as just one, were ranked highly only in the first phase and show an effect only when the inhibitor is applied in the first phase. So to conclude, we presented a method time path to reconstruct the temporal signaling pathways. We presented experimental and statistical validation of the prediction made by the method. And software is available as a Java software at the following URL. To conclude, I want to thank my collaborators, Ziv Bar Joseph, who is my advisor, uh, Joel Arise from University of Coimbra, Portugal, and Velpandi Abayabu and Jay Venkatachari at University of Pittsburgh for running the experiments the computational biology group at IBM Research uh, for many helpful suggestions on the talk, and um, NSF, NIH, and James McDonald Foundation for the funding. And just future work, we are in collaboration with the group at University of Pittsburgh, Harvard, and Yale to apply our method to their data. Yeah, thank you.